Hey guys, Eric Bischoff here to talk to you about my friends over at SaveWithConrad.com. Are you looking to get out of debt? Conrad and his team can make that happen faster than me firing the hockey talk man. Wow. And you know that controversy creates cash, right? Do you know what doesn't create cash? Credit card debt. Save with Conrad can help you consolidate high interest credit cards and all of your other debt into one low monthly payment. They can even help you get the cash you need for home improvements or anything else. They've helped 83 weeks listeners save 500, 600, 700, even $800 a month. Seriously, your papers are going to go down faster than nitro ratings in 2000. Ouch! And how about this? No house payments for two months. That's right, no house payments for two months. And unlike the dirt sheets, man, the reviews do not lie. With over 1,000 five-star reviews, find out for yourself how much Conrad and his team can save you by checking out savewithconrad.com today. Be grateful you did. NMLS number 65084, Equal Housing Lender. Woo! Hey, hey, it's Conrad Thompson, and you're listening to Grilling JR. And of course, we couldn't do it without the voice of professional wrestling, the Hall of Famer himself, Mr. Jim Ross. Jim, how are you, man? Pretty good, Connie. How are you doing, buddy? Man, better than I deserve. Excited to be with you today. And first of all, man, high five. Congratulations. You were back behind the desk this past Saturday night, yeah, back where yeah. you belong, man. Oh, collision. How cool was that to be back at work, dude? We were excited yeah. to see you. It was great, Connie. It was absolutely great. I, uh, you know, you always wonder if you can maintain your timing, excuse me, my nose is running, uh, and how you're going to fit in with two new guys, uh, Ian and, uh, uh, Nigel McGinnis, Nigel, of course, God damn it's, it's morning. I, I'm, my mind is still catching up with everything. Uh, and I had fun working with those guys. They did a good job. They're prepared. They're unselfish. They listen. That's one of the key things about announcing is listening to your partner or partners so that you can connect the dots and not leave something hanging. So, uh, I had fun. I had a good time that, and the match that we had, uh, uh, CM Punk and Ricky Starks was the, with steamboat mm. uh, was that was excellent. It was excellent. Did you see the show at all to see the last match? At least I did. I loved it. Thought steamboat was fantastic. Thought it was a, uh, a star making moment for Ricky Starks. And, uh, I, I just think it's a great show, man. I think it's one of my favorite shows I watch every week. Uh, the time just flies by. And I think that's some of the magic of having a two hour show and not a three hour show sometimes, but yeah, it was a great show, man. And it felt special. It felt big. And then I love the post show stuff that we got to see with Dennis Condry, uh, getting his flowers from, yeah. uh, Dax and, and the rest of FTR, of course, cash and well, I guess CM Punk now, he's sort of the unofficial member of there, the CMFTR. Yeah. And, uh, man, as I understand it, you guys are back in quote unquote Crockett country, the spiritual home of Starcade. You're in Greensboro this weekend. How cool is that? Yeah, it's going to be fun. It's going to be fun. I remember the first time I went to Greensboro, uh, was when Shivani and I were partners on the, uh, oh gosh, Clash of Champions. Mm, there you go. Clash one, actually. God almighty. Clash Thing one. Claire, yeah. And, uh, they went their 40 minute Broadway, they had a draw. So, uh, it was, it was a great experience because of all the history in that building from over the years, I kind of tagged into that, and enjoyed it. So Greensboro, and it's a nice trip. I'm going to fly to Charlotte on Saturday. Then I'm going to drive to, uh, Greensboro, which is only an hours change, meet up with Raphael Morphy and, uh, connect with him. Then we'll drive back after the show to Charlotte, stay near the airport, and then I'll fly home Sunday morning. So not a, not a bad little trip for me. Had a real interesting week at the, I went to my first, uh, infectious disease doctor appointment on t Monday and uh, he wants me to get an MRI, which I've got scheduled and it'll be done next week to make sure that nothing has compromised my tibia, which is that ankle bone area. So, uh, I'm hoping knocking on wood, that's me knocking on wood that, uh, the bone is still clean because the last thing I need is to go 
get treatment for that, which would be a daily deal, and uh, then or have some bone removed. All that shit I don't need. So uh, fingers crossed on that deal, man. Just another, it's another another challenge. You just I just got to deal with it. I just I'm not taking it lightly. I'm not uh, take, taking uh, you know. Oh, everything's cool. Everything's not really cool, but it could be cool. I'll find out next week. So us. Keep your fingers crossed for me, folks, on that little deal. And uh, we'll continue to move forward as best we can in this uh, situation. So I'm, uh, but I'm feeling good. I feel great. Uh, ready to go to work again this weekend. And, you know, the atmosphere at collision, in my opinion, is entirely different than the mi- mindset of the atmosphere at, uh, uh, at Dynamite. There's less people, less crew, less talents. So it's a lot calmer. I think the talents have more time to work, uh, their matches out. And, uh, it seems to be, it's just a different atmosphere. So I'm trying to say, and it's a good atmosphere. So, uh, always fun. Good seeing the talents. We got, we got a good crew on, uh, I think punk and Tony Khan pretty much put that roster together. And I like it. Got some good talents. Uh, they're motivated. They like it. They'd like the ownership of that show and the fact that they can make a difference. And, uh, I think that's cool. So all good, man. It's all good. I'm looking forward to it. You know, I, I enjoy being around the talent. Well, we enjoy seeing you back on TV. So glad that you're back and, uh, man, we're pulling for you on your next doctor's appointment. I know Thank that, you. that, uh, going to be a little stressful, a little anxiety ridden, but, uh, we're excited that you're back where you belong. And I can't believe man, we're just a few weeks away now, less than three weeks away from the biggest AEW show in history. Yeah. All in, uh, as I understand it, they've now surpassed the number of tickets that were sold for WrestleMania three. So we sort of talked about when this show was first announced that in my opinion, this was the AEW equivalent of WrestleMania three. And now it looks like it's going to be up there capacity wise. This is an exciting time for AEW, And of course, just one week later is all out in Chicago. Right. And Starcast is back and uh, we're the unofficial, I guess, uh, convention partner for AEW on this one. So there'll be a ton of great AEW talent, but we've just recently announced that we'll have Tony Khan on the stage for the first time ever at a Starcast. Uh, so we'll be able to pick his brain just one week removed from Wembley, which should be fantastic. Uh, and we've also announced that Dennis Rodman is going to be making his first star cast appearance. And I think for the first time in over 35 years, Kawada is coming to the United States. We just announced that last night on social media. Uh, so make plans to, uh, join us bracelets, get you access to all of our panels. And that's right. Kawada is going to be on stage with Eddie Kingston. Uh, Eddie has such a passion for Japanese pro wrestling and their history and uh, who better to join him than perhaps the guy he modeled his ring gear after. I mean, Kawada was known for the black and yellow, the same colors that Eddie Kingston dons. We'll learn that and a whole lot more at Starcast. If you haven't already pick up a bracelet, come join it. It is a super event for wrestling super fans. You get to meet some of your favorite hall of famers and legends and stars of the day, buy some cool swag and merch that maybe you haven't ever seen anywhere else. And here's some stories you won't hear anywhere else. It all happens September 1st, 2nd, and 3rd. Pick up a bracelet and get you access to all events. S-T-A-R-R-C-A-S-T.com. And Jim, we uh, we were able to announce once you were back on Collision, hey, man, you're back on the road. You're going to be with us at StarCast again. You missed last year. I'm glad you're back, baby. Yeah, Come on. I am too. Thanks for inviting me. I'm looking forward to it. I always enjoy meeting the fans. And, you know, without them, we have to re- recognize we're nothing. We don't even need to be, we don't even, even exist. <clears throat> so, uh, I'm excited about that. I fans from all over the country. How are, how are things moving? Are you, or is the crowd going to be uh, good? Oh man. People are going to be on fire. You know, some of these things have never happened before. We haven't announced all the panels yet, uh, but we're going to start announcing more and more of those panels, but we've got some fun stuff already announced. Danhausen has his own panel there. What in the world? Uh, and as I said, Tony Khan's on stage, Kawada's on stage, lots of really fun stuff coming down the pike. And we still got a couple of tricks up our sleeve, but, Uh-oh. uh, even, even hall of famers like sting, man, they're all going to be there at Starcast. We want you to be there too. And if you can't get to Chicago premier has it 
covered for you. You can watch from the comfort of your own home live or on demand. And when you order StarCast six, you actually get StarCast one through five as well. Talk about a value. And they even give you two months of the new premier plus program, which includes their big showcase event. That's coming up just a couple of weeks after that, all included with the purchase of StarCast six. So be sure to check it out at StarCast on premier.com. That's StarCast on premier.com. But Jim, I feel like we've got to at least talk about what happened this past weekend. We're all excited about what's going to happen, right. but on the other channel, man, they set all kinds of records for SummerSlam, the most watched SummerSlam in history, the biggest gate in, in SummerSlam history, uh, the biggest gate besides WrestleMania in history for WWE and the most sponsorship revenue for a SummerSlam ever. So they've set every kind of record you can possibly imagine. Uh, 59,000 folks in attendance there and, uh, lots of folks talking about that show, uh, in the, in the following days, but maybe my favorite moment was, uh, the Cody Rhodes match. And I wanted to see if you had a chance to see Cody and Brock and what you thought of that one. I saw some highlights, Connie, uh, quite frankly, the, uh, Monday night, uh, the cold open which uh, summarized what all happened at, uh, at, uh, SummerSlam. Yep. It was, was, uh, very, uh, informative. I did not watch SummerSlam and it's from start to finish. Uh, but I did see highlights and I certainly on the, regarding Cody and Brock, uh, I watched the, the highlights and I've seen a lot of tape on it. Uh, you know, of course the, the picture here that we're showing now, uh, was kind of the exclamation point to that match with yep. Lesnar reaching out raising Cody's hand, shaking hands, you know, it was, it was just a really a cool moment and Cody's on his, he's on his way. I mean, everybody not, seems to know that all he's, he's building toward is, uh, the main event at WrestleMania next year in Philly. So I'm uh, happy for Cody. I saw his mom there a little shot of her on camera, which is cool. So it was, a. Uh, it was a hell of a match and, uh, Lesnar did business the right way. Can't say that. Can't say anything different. He did the business the right way. And it was really, uh, uh, fun to watch quite frankly, what I got to watch of it. So it was good. I, I, uh, I'm glad they did well, you know, uh, high tide raises all shifts as the old saying goes. So, uh, I think that's indicative of pro wrestling, especially I remember back in the mid South days. We're going to be talking about mid South here in a couple of minutes, but in the mid South days, uh, when, uh, WWF at the time was kicking ass and, and going through all their expansion and, and all the stuff, uh, it was just, it was just amazing, uh, how much it helped the mid South business. So I, I just, I believe I'm glad that all companies are doing well. We, I'm glad that we're not talking about one brand versus the other. Yeah. And, and all that shit. Just enjoy. If you like wrestling, like wrestling period. So, uh, that's kind of where I am on that deal. So I'm glad they did well. My congratulations to them. And, uh, we hope to be able to replicate some of those same traits, uh, over at, at Wembley stadium should be, it should be, a you know, just they, we started late announcing matches and, and apparently, damn, my nose is running. And, uh, the, uh, it's kind of cool that, uh, you know, going this long without any matches and ticket sales being as they are, I'm not sure exactly what the number is today. I haven't looked, I just know it's good. And, uh, so what are we at now? Over 70,000 over 80, 000, I don't know. 70, over 78,000. Yeah. Last I saw we were. Really close to 79,000 tickets, which is just crazy. Yeah, and, and that's a real number. Yes. That's not a WrestleMania three number. It's <laughs> right. A, it's a real, no, it really is. It's a real number. Uh, it's, you know, it, it, the, the real attendance for WrestleMania three was in the seventies, which is phenomenal, but I think it was listed as 93,000 or something like that. I think the actual sold uh, or the actual attendance for WrestleMania has been, uh, vetted as being 78,000. And, yep. uh, as you and I are recording this wrestle ticks over on Twitter on the fourth gave an update 
saying that uh, all in is set up for 84,048 tickets. And of that they've distributed 78,189. So there's about 5,800 tickets left to move to be completely quote unquote clean. Yeah. And what's amazing is as we're recording this, there's been one match announced. Normally when you have a big show like this and you're in the nitty gritty, just three weeks out, we've got three, four, five, maybe six matches. Uh So you got to think as we get closer and closer, as more of those matches are announced, we've got a real shot here to get 84,000 folks in there. That would be, I mean, it's already unbelievable, but the idea that you could sort of hang your hat on, Hey, we sold out Wembley that when they first announced that I remember a lot of online pundits saying, boy, if they get 30,000, that's a win. Boy, if they get 40,000, that's a high five. (laughs) They've doubled that now. It's, it's really impressive. Yeah. And you got the walk up to to consider. Yes. And you know, a lot of people that don't have an overabundance of disposable income will wait as long as they can to, to retain that, that money until it's go time a walk up time. So I feel confident that there's a legitimate chance. We're going to meet the goal of, of selling out the damn thing. And if so, uh, good on us, you know, good on us. Uh, I, I the, uh, MJF and Mike and, uh, Adam Cole, uh, Adam Cole match is, uh, certainly we're hanging our hat on that right now. Anyway, sure. Uh, I look at, uh, it looks like it'll be punk and Samoa Joe, which I said on TV the other night, I would pay my way. I said that tongue in cheek, I'd pay my way to London to call that match. If given the opportunity and, uh, I would uh, quite frankly, to be honest with you. So, uh, the, the, uh, it'll be, it'll be good. It'll be cards going to be loaded. Talent's going to be very, very motivated to, to make their mark on this uh, amazing event and, uh, and contribute. So it's a, it's a, it's a great experience. I'm looking at it and I'm very motivated to be a part of that show somehow. If I call one match or two or three, whatever, whatever Tony Khan wants is fine with me, but, uh, it, it should be good. We got no shortage of announcers. We got a good announcing crew. So it looks like everybody ha- should have a opportunity to, to contribute. And that's kind of what you want to be. You want to be in a position to contribute to the success of a major event. And I got, this is a major event without question. I mean, I think when it's all said and done, people will talk about this as being, you know, the biggest event in AEW history, certainly. But at the same time, I also believe it's fair to say that, you know, we're, this besides WrestleMania is going to be the biggest wrestling event of the year. Uh, not just in terms of attendance and gate and all those sort of business metrics, but just fanfare and interest, you know, just from the fans, by the way, I want to mention, you know, we, um, you briefly touched on, uh, Hey, don't forget there's, there's the walk-up. We're not even factoring in the walk-up, right? Well, a couple of days ago, they had a Monday night raw, of course, the Monday after uh, the big summer slam show. And as I understand it, they had like an extra thousand folks, roughly do a walk up the day of. So I, I've seen some people online say, oh, well, nobody does walk up anymore. Uh, but, oh, but yeah. I think they added like 900 tickets, uh, between summer slam and the actual event on Monday night. So if your walk up is, you know, 900 and change or so, if that's the real number, uh, for a Monday night raw, you got to think that it's not out of the question that you would have two, three, four thousand as a walk up there. And, and, and yeah. we're not that far away from a sellout. So I'm pulling for them. I'm excited to see what's coming, but I'm also excited that we can take care of our beards now with manscaped. That's right. Manscaped is hooking you up that beard hedger pro kit. We've been talking about it for a while now. And if you've got facial hair and you haven't been using this, what are you waiting for? First of all, if you've got facial hair, whether it's a goatee or a mustache, or you're rocking a beard like I am. The pro kit has everything you need. It's got a cordless trimmer with a rotary wheel. That's the actual beard hedger. Now here's what makes theirs special. Instead of coming with a whole junk drawer full of guards, you got 20 hair cutting links with just one guard here with Manscaped. So it's going to be easier to take care of. You don't have to worry about losing this or that. It's all right there. And by the way, it's also waterproof. So you can shave in the shower, not just do it in the sink and clog up your sink in the process. It's got a titanium coated T-blade. That's tough on hair, but smooth on your face. 
And they've also made sure to round out this kit with everything you need to take care of your facial hair. How about beard shampoo and conditioner? I know what you're thinking. Well, I'll just use regular shampoo and conditioner. Well, your head hair is different from your facial hair. This is designed specifically for your beard to help reduce those ingrown hairs, moisturize that beard, replace the natural oils and just promote overall beard health. And they've also got beard oil in the kit. That's going to relieve the dryness, both on the beard and the skin underneath. It also adds a little shimmer and shine. And how about the beard balm where you can really shape and style and sculpt that look. If you've got a little uh, ZZ top action going on, let's keep it in place. Let's keep it not looking nice. And they've got three other free gifts here in the package that I use on the regular, the beard brush, which if you've never had one, you're missing out the comb, which makes it uh, nice for photos and the scissors. So you can get all your lines just like you like. It's everything you need to impress. It's all included in the beard hedger pro kit. This is not only just for you, by the way, but if there's somebody in your life, who's hard to buy for, this is something that they might not buy for themselves, but they're going to be thrilled to have it. Because a lot of times people don't know they want something or need something until they get it. And that's been my experience with this. I thought, oh man, I kind of got that figured out. And then I started trying some of these products and I'm like, dude, well, I, I'm, I need a late slip. I was behind. This makes a great gift is what I'm trying to strive at. So if you've got somebody in your life who maybe is going off to college, or maybe they're starting a new job or maybe they're just hard to buy for and they got a birthday. Well, dude, this is the way to do it. And why not get 20% off and free shipping in the process? Use our promo code Jim Ross at manscaped.com. That'll get you 20% off with free shipping at manscaped.com. Just be sure to use the promo code Jim Ross manscaped beard hedger. One stroke, one guard, 20 links. Really a great company. Great sponsor. They've been with us religiously and that's because we sell them a lot of product. And I think that, uh, we're still doing that. It's, it's just, I use uh, the manscaped products regularly. Uh, on my little goatee, beard, whatever the hell. So uh, I'm a big fan of Manscaped. So check them out. 20% off, free shipping. Manscaped.com, promo code Jim Ross. And uh, you'll be happy that you did. We, uh, we're tagging in on a big topic here today. One of our best reviewed episodes ever we did earlier this year. We sat down to talk about mid South and it became a darker conversation than we planned. So we changed the name of the show to the dark side of mid South. We're going to pick up where we left off. Maybe it won't be as dark, but here's what you can count on with Jr. He's going to tell you the truth and, and we're going to have a lot of fun talking about his start in professional wrestling and his love of mid South wrestling. But before we do, since I said the words dark side, I wanted to see if you had a chance to see the Marty Jannetty dark side that aired earlier this week. I have not. I have not. I've been uh, for doctors and running around here and there. I haven't seen. How was it? Man, it was interesting to say the least. Uh, they, they get into the, uh, the rumor and innuendo that surrounded Marty Jannetty's post on Facebook a handful of years ago where there was an alleged murder discussed behind a bowling alley. And Wow. They interviewed a bunch of different folks and man, the ending is not exactly what I expected. So, uh, if you like dark side and you support what they're doing, I highly recommend that you check it out. That was their season finale. They finished with a bang. Marty Janetti was the subject matter, but today, uh, we're, we're keeping, keeping it between the ditches. As I like to say, talking about Leroy McGurk and the cowboy bill Watts and all things mid South. You wrote in your book. Mid South was rolling along just fine because Bill loved to keep an iron fist on all parts of the business. He wasn't afraid to put his foot down when he needed, especially when the wrestlers he fought so hard to protect. Uh, most of the boys would take Cowboys famous fines with their mouth shut, but some wouldn't like Dick Murdoch. We talked a little bit about Dick Murdoch in our other episode, but talk to me about the fines and, and, and how Dick handled those fines with, uh, with the Cowboys. <laughs> Oh, Murdoch was a classic. I remember talking to him one time. He got fined for something. I think being late, he was habitually late. Cowboy hated people that were tardy. Didn't understand why people couldn't tell time to be there. He wants you to be at work on time, mentally ready to go and in shape and motivated. And so, uh, and Murdoch could do all those things. Mur when Murdoch wanted to perform, he was just about as good as anybody I've ever seen. And I've seen the, the best in these last almost 50 years. Uh, but Dickie told me one time, he said, well, I got cowboy this time. I said, what did you do, Dick? 
he said, well, I, he fined me. I can't remember what it was, $500 or something like that. And, uh, so he, uh, he Murdoch decided that if he didn't, if he didn't uh, move forward on this thing, that, uh, cowboy would and not cash the check cause he got fined at almost everything he was going to make. I mean, cowboy hit him hard on this, but it had been repeated, a repeat offender. And, uh, Dickie, I think sometimes just wanted to see how far he could push the big cowboy. And, you know, they had that Oklahoma, Texas rivalry thing going and, and, uh, and Bill was the boss and Murdoch was the anti-establishment. So consequently, uh, uh, Murdoch says to me, I'm not going to cash that check and he'll never be able to balance his checkbook. That was his comeback. My goodness. He'll never be able to balance his checkbook. He'll always be looking for this money. And I'm not cashing his check. And so then Murdoch took the check and framed it and put it in his, his bar in Amarillo called Dick's dive. And there it was on the wall. So, uh, Murdoch really got back. Dickie, he, it's funny how, guy, how guys think, right? But cowboy was very meticulous with his money, obviously. And so, uh, Murdoch's idea was, well, he, he won't be able to balance his checkbook. He'll be frustrated. He'll be. He'll be pissed off wondering what the hell happened. And, uh, so that was Dickie's deal. But when Murdoch was motivated and he was in a program that he liked and then working with somebody that he liked, he, he was about as good as there was. There was talk, uh, more than casual talk about Murdoch becoming the NWA champion at one time, uh, believe it or not. But the promoters were just worried about his. You know, Dickie was like to clown around in the ring. Sometimes he had his three stooges r- r- routine and he had all kinds of things that he did. Uh, but he was, he was, he was tough to, I, I got along with him. Great. And I, I had a van and he liked to drive. He's like Tony Schiavone. He liked to drive. And so, uh, Dickie, uh, uh, drove my van and, and, uh, we drank beer. And, and he, he, we, he drank more than me. He could drink more beer than the only guy I saw that could drink more beer than Murdoch was Andre. Wow. And, yeah. So uh, Murdy Murd had two hollow legs. I used to tell him. So, <laughs> yeah, places, I've never heard that before. I love that. So he was a, 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 a hell of a character, but the thought was, can Dickie work well enough as a baby face or a heel to, to travel these territories? Right and represent the NWA title as it is, was intended to do well, the question. The answer was yes. Great worker, but what are you going to get? You getting a three stooges comedy routine tonight, or are you getting, you know, I remember referring the match one time. Uh, he had a great program in mid South did Murdoch, uh, with, uh, killer Carl Cox. It was one of the best workers I ever saw and a great heel, great strategist, great psychology. And, uh, I'm refereeing and I remember we were in Baton Rouge remember like it was yesterday and, uh, Murdoch pushed, uh, or excuse me, Cox pushed Murdoch back in the corner and started doing comedy and, and Cox, they're in a serious angle. I mean, they beat the shit out of each other, a lot of blood, a lot of violence, a lot of aggression. And so, uh, Murdoch, uh, was farting around and, and, uh, Cox was pissed because he felt like that's going to cost him money in their serious angle. And it, it was a good point. Right. So, uh, I'm standing on the Murdoch's left cause he's right-handed. So if you're a referee and you get somebody going in the corner, you want to get it off their, their dominant hand so that you don't get hit in the face with a elbow coming back like that to punch somebody. And, uh, Cox. He didn't rear off. He had it like a six inch punch. Boom, boom. And he knocked Murdoch's ass almost out. His legs went limp. Oh, wow. And, uh, I grabbed one arm to hold him up because Murdoch, or excuse me, Cox told me to grab him, grab him. And then Cox got the other arm and swung, uh, Murd back into the corner. Uh, but it's just a, di- a different. I can only imagine when guys were doing comedy today, when they occasionally do it and, uh, how, how that's going, how that would work, uh, in, in those days, I know how it would work. 
guys took everything very seriously. Yes. They only got paid off the houses. They didn't get, you know, there wasn't pay-per-views. There wasn't other the merchant, the merch, the, uh, merchandise was not a big deal. Added a little bit, not much. So, uh, but when Dickie wanted to work, he was about as good as you could find. It's just, what do you get on oh, some days? You weren't quite sure what you're going to get. And, uh, I also noticed that I think I can't remember when cowboy passed out the checks. I think it was midweek at TV or something, the interviews and then the TVs. And I always thought that was kind of a mistake. Those guys would get boo-boo faced before television. If they didn't get the mm-hmm. payoff that they thought they deserved, but cowboy didn't care. You're getting what you earned and, and that's that. So it was a interesting, interesting education in so many areas of pro wrestling, uh, for me to be a future administrator and, uh, you know, executive officer, blah, blah, blah. Uh, it was the, it's like getting a, uh, you know, a PhD in this shit. So it was crazy. There we are. Cowboy, good old JR. I remember that tie. Jim bought it for me. Nice tie. Big cowboy. Bright eyed. Boy, he was smart. Great strategist. But he had that Vince Lombardi feel about him. The former coach of the Packers, who was a uh, you know, staunch disciplinarian, had rules that you had to adhere, adhere to and abide by. And so, uh, and, and the irony of that is Cowboy really never changed. If you came into the territory, you knew that there was a fine system in place. He, Cowboy didn't have many rules, but he expected you to adhere and to follow the rules that were laid out. And I don't think that's a bad philosophy, but his problem was Cowboy. And I love him. He's still, uh, he's still alive and well, sharp as ever. He lives in the Ozarks uh, in retirement. He's in his eighties and, uh, sometimes his presentation skills, uh, were a little bit stiff and some guys could adapt to the stiffness. Some guys couldn't, that's his booking book. I've looked at that a million times. He once broke that book out to talk about the Superdome and the first pro wrestling event at the Superdome happened on July 17th, 1976. Yep. When Leroy McGurk was still running the city with Bill Watts as his booker and partner Watts, this, according to uh, Dave Meltzer here, spearheaded going into the Superdome, a mo a move that most thought he was nuts to try. New Orleans was not known as a good wrestling market. And it's not like they were frequently selling out the arenas, right? Watts felt and correctly. So that if he put on a loaded show, the likes of which people in the city had never seen. The lure of wrestling at the Superdome would draw people who would normally never attend. In many ways, this was the beginning of the concept of quarterly supercards. Now, I just want to put into context what Dave is writing there. This was the beginning of the concept of quarterly supercards. Now, we know in 1983, again, remember this is 1976. In 1983, around Thanksgiving, Jim Crockett promotions is going to run Starcade, And that's like the quote unquote first mega show, or at least the one that people are talking about with closed circuit and sort of the precursor for pay-per-view. Mm-hmm. But when the WWF decides in 1988 to spin off and not just do a WrestleMania, but to actually do a SummerSlam and a survivor series, and they followed up with the Royal rumble. Those became those big four quarterly events. That's more than 10 years after this. So cowboy was a real innovator here and somebody who's rolling the dice in a big way. You were there for some of this. What do you remember about the Cowboys idea to, if you build it, they will come, man, let's run the Superdome. Yeah. He was, uh, very, uh, oh, motivated. He, he thought that the concept would work and, and it did. Uh, I, I was not at the first big event. And I, but I remember the poster, the window poster was very colorful. Uh, they had d- just adorned the town with all these posters. Uh, they had some, they had a low end ticket so that it didn't keep anybody from coming if they chose to, at least from the 
price of the tickets. Uh, I think it is like $76,000, which sounds like nothing now, but then it was a lot. It was an awful lot of money. And, uh, and of course with that comes the expectation that you're going to get this biggest payoff you ever got. And for some guys that may have been true for others. It wasn't. And for those that it wasn't, it caused a little bit of dissension and, and, you know, Michael Hayes this very day believes that, uh, uh, he and the Freebirds got screwed on a big payoff when they work with dog. And, uh, I shall get a kick out of, cause if I can bring it up somehow, he'll, he'll take it. He'll run with the story. It's pretty cool. So, uh, with great success comes great expectation. That's right. And when you're, uh, paying on this, uh, discretionary income, so in other words, the discretion of the paymaster, i.e. cowboy, uh, could be put in question because there wasn't a formula, so to speak, as to how you arrive at a payoff. It was cowboy's judgment based on the house and the available money and the talent pool. So, uh, again, with great success comes great expectation. And, uh, and some guys after all these years still believe that uh, they get shorted on the payoff, but. Uh, you know, that's, that's not, that's not, and that's not a new concept in pro wrestling guys think they got shorted a little bit on the payoff. Uh, it's, it happens more often than not. And it's kind of expected quite frankly. So, uh, it, but he was, he was shooting for the stars there. And, uh, the other thing about that is that he knew that if we had some success that it would, uh, uh, maybe motivate talents who are moving from territory to territory to, to, uh, to come in and get booked in mid South <clears throat> and excuse me, and get a run there. So, uh, it had a lot of advantages. It had some disadvantages that some might not think about, but, uh, he, uh, he had a, he had, a, he had a hand pick roster, yep. a, a, a lot of really good workers. And so that was kind of how the, the whole foundation was built on talented workers who are, were physical, good psychologists. And, uh, and it was just great. I, I had, I, I learned so much there. I would never have been an EVP of WWE or anything along the lines of success I had in talent relations, et cetera, et cetera. If I had not first worked, uh, for cowboy in mid South, I got my foundation there and setting his side hearing him talk to talents, hearing him talk to other promoters, uh, was, was really good. I sat in a conversation with him one time <laughs> with a noted NWA promoter who was called to represent the other promoters to tell cowboy that, uh, you know, pushing, having a black booker, Ernie Ladd, and having a black top baby face and JYD was going to kill the business. It's going to kill it. Because in that era, you know, you had, if you had a, a black, if you had blacks on the card, it was like one. So, uh, and that's stupid. Uh, so I remember Cowboy telling the guy, I said, you know, I don't, I, uh, I, green is my favorite color. Green. There you go. And so, and these guys are subtle tickets. So it was, uh. And that's how he handled it. And he didn't change his philosophy. He didn't, he didn't replace Ernie. JYD walked eventually. So, uh, it was, it was pretty cool. It was really, I look back so many times and what I learned on what day and how I, how I interpreted what he did is pretty cool. So I owe cowboy a lot for that. It was different to me being sitting here in a beachside condo in Jacksonville beach. Uh, to live in a trader house in Eastern Oklahoma. Well, they all showed up for that first Superdome show. We talked about it. 1976, man, 17,000 fans were there to see Terry Funk retain his NWA world title against the cowboy. It was a doctor stoppage because Watts was bleeding too badly to continue. It was also a blindfold match between Dick Murdoch and killer Carl Cox. Uh, four matches deep. Headline attractions, as far as that goes, Andre, the giant and Buck Robley taking on Ken Patera 
and Bruiser Rob Sweetan. What a Dick prick. Bruiser going to a uh, double DQ with Abdullah the Butcher. It's a pretty loaded card. And man, fans showed up. They wanted to see that NWA world title match. They wanted to see Andre the Giant and Abdullah the Butcher. 17,000 fans. You thought it was maybe a $76,000 house. Uh, using so. the handy dandy inflation calculator these days, that would mean $407,000. Wow. Um, they're going to come back on July 22nd, 1978, and have 23,800 fans. And Meltzer would say that that set what was believed to be the all time indoor gate record for pro wrestling, $142,675 for a show that was headlined by Ray candy beating Ernie Ladd in a cage match. The other top promoted matches were the North American champion, Paul Orndorff beating bruiser Brody and dusty Rhodes wrestling superstar, Billy Graham, a loaded card. But again, think about that main event. It's Ray Candy and Ernie Ladd in a cage match. Man, Ray Candy's a guy we don't hear nearly enough about. What can you tell us about Ray Candy? Big guy, you know, African American gentleman, uh, nice fella. But he had a good program with Ernie. Ernie wanted to make him, make uh, Ray. And uh, he Ernie had looked at the whole lay of the land. And in Louisiana and Mississippi, uh, how you catered to the black fan was important. Uh, and there were a lot of uh, African-Americans in that region of the country. So, uh, Ernie had an angle that would appeal to those people very prominently, very, and, and, and they, they turned out, uh, you know, if you said today, well, we're going to headline this big dome show with Ernie and Ray candy, people might Ray candy, Ernie, I can see, but Ray candy, I don't get that, but Ernie got him ready. Ernie's TV time and, the and Ray candies, how he was used on mid South television, uh, you know, a big, strong black man, uh, and, and Ernie could talk him into the building. There's some shot of Ray, Ray candy, on, uh, nice man. And a big fella, big, ath big athletic guy, real high pitched voice. Uh, I remember that, but he was a nice man and, uh, I enjoyed uh, being around those guys. They, they were all excited about what we, what could, could be. And they all probably knew Connie that they're going to get their biggest payoff and, and their careers. A lot of them, some not maybe, but most are, are expecting the record pay payoff for them, uh, on this show. So everybody was in a pretty good mood and, and it was always good. You know, New Orleans is always great. Cowboy had his restaurants. He'd like to go to and, and, uh, you know, I got to tag along, which is always nice. Get a free meal, good meal and, and listen, listen, and, uh, listening to cowboy made me a, a, a better, a, a better hand for the lack of a better term in wrestling. The, uh, the history here of mid South, I think sometimes doesn't get the, the spotlight it deserves. I just want to read that sentence again from Dave here. It was believed to be an all time indoor gate record for pro wrestling at the time. So he has the vision in 76 to run the Superdome has 17,000 fans. There has the gumption to run it again. Two years later, this time there's not 17,000 it's 23,800 and an all time indoor gate record. I mean, I know these days, everybody's talking about WWE, but boy, but that was not something WWE was doing. I mean, appreciate what we're saying here. This is something that this is the new high watermark here in 1978. Let's talk about August of 79 though. That's when Leroy and the cowboy would split. Watts wrote in his book, not long after our Superdome success, I knew it was time Leroy and I went our separate ways. Generally one can take the arrow shot from the front, but it really hurts. It can even destroy you to get shot continually in the back. And that's what I felt Leroy was doing at the time. In 1979, I told him we needed to split and he didn't like it. He reacted by suing me for embezzlement and it hit the front page of the Tulsa world newspaper. You were there for this. What do you remember how this went down and, and the hurt feelings all around? Well, it was just a long relationship that ended abruptly and, uh, and rather, uh, uh, abrasively, you know, cowboy had a counter for that as always. 
you know, the irony was, I think we'll, we had some quotes on this is that, you know, uh, cowboy didn't handle the money. He booked, he made the payoffs, uh, and, but he didn't handle the money. So for him to be sued for embezzlement or something that he didn't manage or have an involvement in was going to be hard to prove. And, uh, so cowboy countersued and as many lawsuits go, once there's a fight back or a reaction, uh, it was settled and they went on their separate ways. But Leroy was getting up there in age as anyway, and you find that when cowboy was on the road, a lot of Leroy's hangers on would come to the office and go through the booking book and, and want to make changes or they ask Leroy a lot of questions about why are you doing this? Or why are we doing that? And they weren't even booked. They were just, they're just guys that were unemployed wrestlers who hung around and stirred shit. And Bill got tired of all that. It's a lot of, uh, as he would say, uh, Leroy's cronies. Uh, a lot of wrestlers that Leroy knew back in the early fifties and things like that. They're still hanging around, man. And it just drove cowboy crazy. And, uh, they screwed up a good deal, quite frankly. And so the, the lawsuit proceeded cowboy countersued and soon thereafter the, the uh, lawsuit was dropped. Yeah. It's, uh, written in uh cowboy's book. I called him and said, well, Leroy, you've done it. Now you've gone public with this and slandered me. Have you forgotten? I never handled the money. You and Dorothy handled the money. How could I embezzle from you? I'm going to counter sue you for slander and I'll end up owning your ranch. His beautiful cattle ranch North of Tulsa was his pride and joy. Yeah. That was, he, in Cl- that was in Claremore, Oklahoma. That was Leroy's sanctuary. And he bought that ranch uh, for years before. And he was, you know, even though he had no sight, he loved going to the ranch and the calmness and the serenity that it provided him to get away from his hangers on and, uh, the stupid ass, uh, storytelling lion, uh, you know, everybody had their hand out for something. Uh, and he just, he, he wasn't going to lose that ranch. And he knew that by advice of his attorneys that, you know, you kind of screwed up here cause we can't prove embezzlement for a man that doesn't handle the money. So it was, that's pretty obvious. So that's kind of where that was. And, uh, cowboy then had the ship to himself. What's it, what's it needed to be. It, it was time. He immediately dropped the lawsuit and agreed to split, uh, bill writing about Leroy here. He kept Oklahoma, Arkansas, our part of Missouri and Wichita falls, Texas. I said, I wanted Louisiana. And he said, then you'll take Mississippi too. And you wrote in your book, much to everyone's surprise. I stayed in Oklahoma Leroy's turf because I had a complex family issue unfolding there. I'd just been through a divorce, which I knew was my doing. And I wanted to be closer to my daughter. Without Bill to keep a lid on the prevailing shenanigans, Leroy's office quickly developed into a political cesspool with the old Stooges tattling on each other, trying to curry favor. The more power the Stooges gained, the more I could feel myself getting squeezed out. Watts's boy, quote unquote, was not loyal to the cause. Talk to me about that. Well, Leroy, see, I, I was young. And I was, uh, had, they, they had high hopes for me to be, uh, involved in the business and more than just hauling the ring, which I did, uh, ring crew. Uh, I remember going to the place where they installed uh, trailer hitches and had that installed on my car. Uh, so I could haul the ring so I could make an extra couple hundred bucks when they had a spot show, which is a, you know, a high school gym or something. Uh, so I, I. So I was taking up a space, a spot and uh, Grizzly Smith and his cronies, uh, were certainly, you know, well, they didn't want me around and I got tired of that bullshit, you know, getting booked where you're going to go from Thursday night in new Orleans to Friday night in Oklahoma city for 40 bucks, you know, didn't even pay for your gas. So, uh, I was, so they were starving me out. So I, I. I said adios and I had a department store in Westville, which is my hometown. And I just said, I'm going to, I'm going home. 
and build this business as best I can. And, uh, but it was just the office politics. That's why I don't like them. I, I was a victim of it and I don't like them at all. <laughs> and it was tough, but here we are. Well, let's, uh, let's talk about where we are. You and I are absolutely loving our Henson razors. And if you haven't already, what are you waiting for? Pick one up, man. I'm telling you, I absolutely love this product so much so that I thought I left mine in Waterloo, Iowa. I panicked, but I knew exactly what to do. I went and ordered a new one at hensonshaving.com slash JR. And they got me one. And as a matter of fact, I ordered two more. Uh, I want to keep one in my travel bag now, and I'm going to keep one here at the house. I'm never going to be without a Henson razor. What's amazing to me is this is a family owned aerospace parts manufacturer. Yeah, you heard me. Razors wasn't the first plan here. These cats made parts for the international space station and the Mars Rover, but then they realized, Hey, you know, we've got these aerospace grade CNC machines hanging around. I bet we could make the thinnest razors you've ever seen. And that's exactly what they did. You see a Henson razor is 0.0013 inches. And you might say to yourself, self, how thick is that? Well, it's thinner than a human hair. And what that means to you is a more secure and stable blade. It means you're less likely to get nicks and cuts and scrapes or those pesky ingrown hairs. It gets better. The razor has built in channels to evacuate hair and cream. That's going to make clogging virtually impossible. As a business guy, I got to tell you, one of the things I appreciate most about Henson is they found a way to not only make something that's better, but it's cheaper. And isn't it true that most of the time, if we want something better, it costs more money. How often do we see that where it's better, but it's also more affordable. Let me explain. They made the best razor, not the best razor business. There's no plastic on a Henson razor. It, if you're watching on YouTube right now, you'll see, man, it's a standard old school, all metal. I mean, it looks like something your grandfather used. There's also no subscriptions here. There's no proprietary blades. It's not like they're going to come out with something new next year that you got to get. And there's no plan to obsolescence. Now, let me explain. If you run down to the drugstore right now, the only thing under lock and key that you can see, but you can't actually touch and get to are the freaking razors. That's how expensive they are. They don't mind. If you steal something else, you want a candy bar, help yourself. You need some razors. Uh, uh, that's where we draw the line. We put it behind lock and key at the drugstore. That's how expensive they are. Now you might be saying, well, how much does this cost? How does three to $5 sound? Not three to $5 a cartridge, not three to $5 a month, not three to $5 a quarter, three to $5 a year. Because once you own this razor, you never need another. You just replace the blades and it works with a standard old school blade, the double sided blade, like, well, everyone in pro wrestling is very familiar with, <laughs> except they never had a razor this thin. It's time to say no to subscriptions. Let's say yes to a razor that will last you a lifetime. Visit hensonshaving.com slash JR to pick the razor for you and use the code JR. You'll get two years worth of blades free with your razor. Just be sure to add them to your cart. That's 100 free blades. When you head to H E N S O N S H A V I N G.com slash JR and use the promo code JR. Man, I love a great shave. I, I am a mark for a good smooth shave and you get it every single time with the Henson shaving. It's, it's just a, and they just simplified it. You know, it's one of those deals. I, I've said this before on the show and I, I don't know where my mind is all the time, but you know, I, uh, I, I, why didn't I think of this? Yeah. Conrad, why didn't you think of this? You know what I mean? It's just a, amazing how, what they've done. Just using logic and common sense and their special set of skills. So, uh, if you got a beard or if you shave, uh, you know, you owe it to yourself. Give this thing a shot because it ain't going to break the bank. It's a, it's a great value. And, uh, it's a, the blade is engineered to be the sharpest, nicest, smoothest shave that you could ever get. So give it a shot. Make your life simple. Don't overthink it. Instantshaving.com slash JR and uh, two years worth of blades free with your razor. I can't beat that. You're going to love it. Seriously, check it out. Let's jump into um, your relationship with Bill. You know, you've always been known as quote unquote, you know, uh, Bill's boy or whatever. Yeah. But when this split happens, 
I was even shocked reading your book that you wound up sticking with Leroy. Were you getting any shit from Bill for that? No, no, not at all. He knew that when I, when he had something for me, uh, and he called, I would be, uh, ready to work. And, you know, Bill and I had a great relationship still do. But, uh, at that time there was so much unrest. He was re reestablishing, reorganizing his staff, opening up his own office. Uh, he, he, uh, had a, I can't remember this lady's name. God dang. I had a tip of my tongue. She was uh, his assistant, George Ann, George Ann say S E A Y I believe. but she was his, uh, she was like a CPA type lady, smart and kept bills, uh, all the books and all this stuff. But, uh, he was reorganizing that he had to get an office. He bought a house in Bixby, uh, 116 Breckenridge, I believe it was right across the street from the old Sonic, which I liked walk across the street, get me a route 44 diet, cherry lime made about any time I wanted it. So, uh, but that, that got me to back with bill, but no, we had no issues. Uh, he, he understood, you know, I had a business, I had a young daughter, uh, kind of a rocky marriage. So I made what I thought was the best decision for me at the time. So, and he, he honored that he understood. Eventually you start booking spot shows, bring in Leroy as your partner. And he wind up booking a series of shows featuring the McGuire twins. And one of their opponents was Bob Sweetan. Yeah. Can you tell us uh, about what Sweetan did with these, uh, McGuire twins? If you're watching on, if you're watching the video, look at the face, of this dirty bastard, what a horrible human being, uh, convicted of child molestation. You know, got ex he got deported from America back to Canada. I think it was in Vancouver in that area of British Columbia. Uh, but he was a bully. It's plain and simple, really simple. And the McGuire twins uh, were were they were in the business because of their they were an oddity. They were six hundred pounds. They're identical twins. And but here's the key thing: they sold tickets to come see these massive twins and remember the shot Conrad, uh, of those two guys in those little scooters. Oh yeah, absolutely. That was a picture we used uh, all the time in these local markets. So you could get, you know, uh, I would do a thing where I would send them the picture and caption it so that they didn't have, they couldn't screw up the ticket sales or the date and time venue place, whatever, uh, right there it is. Good job. Look at old silver. He's right on top of things, but that's, I don't know which one's, which they both had wise figure that out. You do the math on that deal. I think they were Canadian ladies. So Billy and Benny, I think they were from South Carolina originally, I believe somewhere in the South, but sweet hand would take liberties. I mean, he'd slap him in the face hard, cup his hand and hit him in the ears. Uh, Squeeze here, squeeze there. Uh, I, I mean, I've ref I refereed the matches because uh, I was what you know. I didn't want to increase in, increase my payroll, right? So I did the refereeing, and I had a ring crew, so I would put the ring up. I did did as much as I could do, and he was just being a bully. And I've refereed matches, Connie, where literally in the middle of a match, you could hear him weeping. They were scared. They were being physically punished. And I remember back in those days, uh, we had these tag matches. They were so fat. They couldn't even get stand on the apron. So it was always like the old Texas tornado tag like scenario where, you know, they, they started out in the ring and stayed in the ring. So, uh, but they blow up God, and just horrible. I felt so sad for those guys. I had, I want one time. I mean, they're selling, we're selling out of these little high school gyms, sweet tan and Siegfried stanky. whose real name was bill layman. He was a former football college football player down in Texas and a, a coach and nice man. He didn't, he wasn't a party to sweet tan's horse shit. Uh, and, uh, so I remember at one night we had a great house. Thanks are good. 
And then you would, I would call Leroy at his home and he and I would go over the payoff. So I would have a thought in my mind about what the payoff should be. Leroy would up it or down it or what have you. And, uh, so we'd do the, we'd do the, uh, you know, we'd, we'd do the, the that, that, that deal. It was cool. But man, oh man, uh, I went back into, you know, they were crying. And of course, the next thing you hear out of their mouth, Connie, is they want to quit. Right. We're going home. We're going home. Well, I had a lot of shows booked and they were headlining them all. And I uh, went down to talk to them and they were both naked in the shower. And, uh, so I remember <laughs> I go in the shower, stay out of the, out of the water. And, uh, you know, I'm, I'm trying to, uh, you know, offer them the, an inducement of more money. Uh, I'll, I'll we'll give you a food allowance, whatever. And so what of meekly says to me, Jim, you wash my back. <laughs> Why? Well, sure. I will. <laughs> so I washed the McGuire's back to get him to stay in my little spot show thing. And, uh, I figured the solution is going to be real easy get them different opponents and, uh, but sweet Tan was a prick, a horrible man, a really, and I, I was always surprised that he was a good worker. I'm not going to take that away from him. He was a good heel for cowboy to beat up in competitive matches and sweet Tan loved to get blood and cowboy loved to give it to him. So, uh, but he's not, he wasn't cowboys kind of guy. We talked about that. I said, Bill, why the hell did you keep that son of a bitch around? Well, you know, we had nobody better. It's a team thing. He, he was, he was a key player. So anyway, it was, uh, interesting times, Conrad, you gotta be a little bit of a psychologist. You gotta be a good listener. And it was just a, a t interesting time to, to be JR in that era as a young 20 something year old guy trying to learn, you know, hell I have been on the road. I'm learning something every single day. I, uh, I love, we're getting to talk about names I've never heard of like Siegfried stanky, man. That's a name I've never even heard of before. I mean, th that's a name that I don't think there is discussed on a lot of different podcasts here. He's the guy's ball, the goatee course, sweet hands, the other guy stanky was a good guy, big old offensive lineman. Uh, as I recall, uh, and a real smart guy, nice man. And I, you know, he shake his head at some of the things sweet Tan did sweet Tan, and sweet Tan would cheat playing poker. You know, I, I can't remember. I got in a poker game with him, lost my ass and he cheated. And I didn't know he was cheating until some, one of the boys told me. And of course that was my last poker game with sweet Tan. Uh, but he just was not, I, I learned more about it. The more I learned about it, the more I wanted to be uh, as far away from him as I could. But because of the territory, he provided a service. He was a good heel. Uh, he had a lot of TV time. And, uh, but boy, he took advantage of it. He took advantage of those two big kids. And, uh, you know, we were very lucky we didn't run them off. Hey, let's talk about how it all comes to an end uh, with you and Leroy. Uh, I, I think you've written about that you were fired. Is that right? What happened with you and Leroy? How did that get know. sideways? I don't know if I was fired. Where'd you hear that? Silva well, tell you, did Silva tell you that? Silva did <laughs> tell me he got in my ear and said, ask him about when they run. Uh, seriously, what happened? How did that come to an end? You know, Conrad, I'm drawing a blank. I don't think I got fired. I, I quit because of the miserable work conditions with guys like Grizzly and Jack Howe, the referee was another miserable human being. And the drugs were flowing in Louisiana. And, uh, I would venture to say, uh, a lot of underage sex, it was horrible and it was not, it, it was not the way to run a business. And, and eventually cowboy would, uh, make some changes personnel wise that would eliminate some of those issues. But I don't think I was fired. I'm trying to think maybe I was, if I was, I'd say I was, I just don't remember being canned. It's just, you know, Leroy's, uh, business was, he had a, he had a, he didn't have the talent the cowboy was able to accrue. He, he didn't have the talent. Uh, it was just, 
you know, Cowboy was able to go out and he, like he brought in Alpha and Sika, who I really enjoyed working with. I remember going to pick them up at the airport in Tulsa one time. That's another one of my jobs, uh, Aaron boy. And, uh, I went out to get them and they were, they were running out of the airport chasing a guy. And apparently the guy had said something to them, uh, disrespectful. They were wearing their, we call those things, the law of the law of the things are, they're, 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 uh, Island attire. Yeah. And as they were running, a couple of joints fell out their, uh, uh, their, uh, attire. And that caused a stop in the, in the, uh, they stopped chasing, stopped chasing and started looking for their for their, uh, for their joints. It was a wild west show, man. It was a wild west show and, uh, two nicer guys you could never meet with the, then off in Sika and the and cowboy love their toughness. The thing about working in mid South in this in Louisiana, as far as being a heel, you had to have courage and you could not be show any fear mm. to the paying customer, or you would be taken advantage of either going to the ring, leaving the ring going to your car, wherever it may be. Louisiana was a different breed of cats for live events, just violence and aggression. I remember leaving the ring in Lafayette, Louisiana, again, as a referee, we had a hot finish heels went over. And I learned early on that when you, when that happens, you, the referee should always leave with the heels. If you leave with the baby faces, you're a target. And I left the first night there with the baby faces and tried to, you know, my pantomiming, you know, I didn't know, I didn't see this. I didn't see that. And, uh, it was just dangerous. And the cop that was taking me back and us back had a pool cue, the fat end of a pool stick hollowed out. And it was filled with a lead, uh, piece of lead. So it was heavy, but that was her, like a nightstick, Billy club, whatever you want to call it. And, uh, I remember vividly, man, it's a terrible sound walk into the dressing room and a guy grabs me by the neck around the neck or whatever, trying to pull me back. And the cop hits him across the arm of that, uh, that pool cue loaded. And I heard the bone break. Oh, and the guy screaming in agony, like he'd been killed, but that's, I wanted to, I knew I kept having things happen like that on the road and Bill liked my refereeing. I was young and I, you know, there I was, there you are. Uh, he, he liked, he liked a new face. He liked my work, but I knew that this was not something I'm going to do for a long time. Right. Uh, it's not. So I kept trying to move up the ladder, gain another skill set, put more tools in my toolbox so that I could, uh, move on to let's hopefully say greener pastures. August 2nd, 1980, according to Dave Meltzer, Watts does arguably the greatest angle of his career. Dave would say it's a takeoff on the Blassie Tolos angle from 71 in Los Angeles, where they have. Michael Hayes used some hair removal cream that winds up in the eyes of junkyard dog who Watts was promoting as his biggest star. And it was announced that JYD was blinded and would never wrestle again. A couple of weeks later, JYD's then wife gave birth to a daughter and it was promoted that even though blind JYD would come back in a dog collar match inside a cage against Michael Hayes that drew 28,000 paying customers an $183,000 gate, both were indoor pro wrestling records. Again, this is 1980. The NWA is doing their thing. Crockett promotions doing their thing. Certainly Florida doing their thing. Memphis is starting to gain some steam. New York is on fire and the records are being set by Bill Watts here. What do you remember of this Michael Hayes and JYD blinding angle that People still talk about as being a high watermark for that serious heat. It was serious heat. It, it was believable. It was an angle that people could relate to. Uh, and I think that was, I think that was the key. 
uh, you know, when, when a man says, uh, thanks to you guys, I'll never see my daughter. Uh, it struck home. It was personal, a personal issue as personal as one could get quite frankly. And, uh, Michael was just such an amazing heel and they, you know, Michael could talk him into the building and he was almost proud of his accomplishments. Uh, so, you know, it was, it was just a perfect storm. And I think that's the match I was thinking, I was referring earlier about to this very day in 2023, Michael Hayes will tell you that story of how bad he got screwed on that payoff. I think sometimes he does it more for just entertain, to entertain himself. Of course. But, uh, you know, but he's, uh, he, he, may, he helped make that happen and, uh, did a great job. Great job. That was a hell of an angle, man. The personal, personal issues are, that's what sells. And there you see a nice shot there. Look at baby face, Michael Hayes there on YouTube. Of course yeah. he is a heel, but he is a young baby faced Michael Hayes. Uh, oh, yeah. Let, yeah. Let, let me ask you about the, or I just want to add some context because I know I threw it out there, but I want to just connect the dots. The story here, you know, it's one thing that, oh man, he's been accidentally blinded and he'll never get to wrestle again. That's the end of his career. Okay. That's sad. That sucks. But then when the baby's born, he'll never get to see his baby girl. Wow. My goodness. Now yeah. it really is a personal issue. Like, okay. Wrestling's one thing, but man, he's got a kid. He can't even see just fantastic storytelling. It sets all kinds of records. And then just a couple of years later in 1982, Bill officially buys out NWI tri-state from Leroy. It's all back in part of his territory. Watts would write after promoting mid South by myself for a couple of years, I decided it was time in 1982 to go back into Oklahoma. I was kicking ass in Louisiana and Mississippi, but I lived in Oklahoma. So I finally said, what the hell am I doing? Leroy's group was going downhill. He had George Scott booking for him. And George had a reputation for being a good booker in the mid Atlantic States in the seventies. But I thought his concept of booking and his finishes were about as exciting as watching grass grow. I checked on how Leroy's TV shows were doing, and I found they were in arrears with every television station they had. Leroy owed those stations a lot of money. I got his little rock station, then Tulsa, where they liked Leroy, but saw my ratings were much higher than what he was getting for them. When I got to Oklahoma city, that meant I had the territory. Uh, what do you remember about this move? And what can you tell us about his take on, uh, George Scott's booking ability? Well, George was a basic fundamentalist, you know, and, uh, didn't he had, if, if George Scott was oatmeal, he had nothing on it. Okay. It wasn't seasoned. It was fundamentally sound, but the key thing there was, is that getting talent into Leroy's portion of the territory, uh, was, was very challenging. And they were a lot of guys that other territories just didn't want, uh, and didn't want to work with older. Are you really young? And it just, it was not a good mix. There was not a lot of star power in the locker room whatsoever. If there was any, to any degree. So, uh, but I, it was kind of a celebratory situation because cowboy had, it was having all this success down in Louisiana with those Superdome shows that we were talking about. And, uh, I just figured that he would bring that same talent base to to, to, to the North end in Tulsa where the office was going to be. And I thought that was really cool. And it, it opened the door up for me a little bit better. Cause I didn't want to travel everywhere with a young family and all that stuff. Cause I had really, I hadn't really decided that pro wrestling was going to be my one and only, uh, and, uh, I eventually came around to that line of thinking and I'm glad that it did, or you and I would not be talking here right now. Uh, quite frankly, but no, I, uh, I, I, uh, was, it was kind of a celebratory deal. Cowboy coming in, he's got, he built his, he bought this house, as I mentioned earlier, down in Bixby, across the Masonic. And, uh, he could, turned it into a real nice office. Of course he lived down in Bixby on his ranch. And ironically, I did, I, I, when I got divorced, I moved to Bixby as well. So it worked out geographically for me really good. Uh. And he paid me well, he paid me really well. 
he paid me really well until I found out what Bill Dundee was earning low six figures. And I wasn't, and I was doing a lot of work. So I went into Bill and said, look, I don't want to, I'm not going to bore you with this, but I don't think it's, it's equal or justified that I'm making so much less than Dundee who was telling me what he was earning. He was the booker. He was bringing all those ideas from Memphis in and rerunning them, which is great because they, they, by and large, they had been seen before and they worked. So, uh, it was a, it was, I, I was happy that that whole thing went through and, uh, it kind of put Leroy out of his misery because he was so frustrated about the talents and not drawing and they just weren't selling any tickets. It wasn't as tough. I felt bad for Mr. McGurk. There's a shot of him. If you're not watching this on uh, YouTube, you should be checking it out. Yes. So, uh, Leroy's a, but he, he, he's a, Hey, he's another one of my mentors. It's just, he got old. He had his blind handicap and he had surrounded himself with less than positive people. So uh, it was time. It was time for him to move back to the ranch. Let's, um, let's talk about a little excerpt from your book, Jimmy. The familiar voice said over the phone, I need you to put together some ads for me. It was cowboy. And I could tell by his voice, he was in a real good mood. So he should have been things were looking up for Watts in the wrestling business. The Houston territory had just joined the mid South territory out of necessity for Houston promoter, Paul Bosch. He would write, how would you like to come work for me? Jim Watts asked before I could finish my sentence, I was stunned, but my body filled head to toe with a rush of adrenaline. Just at the mere thought of it. I wanted more than anything to get back to the business. I love to get back to ringside, to get back on the road that aged me before I could answer Watts continued. Things are getting bigger. And I want you to come on board as a director of marketing for mid South sports. Yes. I said immediately, I knew it wasn't the job I wanted. I knew it was an offer that I could sell to all the people who wanted me to just settle down. My wife included, I was back in the wrestling business but not back in the wrestling business. I'm the marketing guy. I'm back in, but not back in, but I was back in. Yeah. I love this. And, and I want to know, like, what was life like between, you know, you going back to work for the cowboy and, and things winding down with Leroy, what were you doing in between there? Well, I had a store in Westville. I had a department store, Conrad, uh, in Westville and, uh, it was doing okay. But I was, I was felt locked in. I felt restricted back in my hometown where I grew up, which is not a bad thing, but it, for growth of a young, ambitious entrepreneur, it wasn't a thing to do. So, uh, I was doing that. I ended up bankrupting. I went bankrupt in that store. Oh, and, and so that was tough, uh, dealing with that, you know, going bankrupt in your hometown is after being the, you know, all American boy there and having success as a young man, uh, it was hard to handle. So that's what I did. I was doing that. It, we, the store got bankrupt. I moved to Tulsa, got a job at, uh, K what was it? KTFX country music. It was an FM country station. And that was about the time of the, uh, urban cowboy craze and all that stuff. So. We did well at the station. I, I worked a morning drive shift with the general manager, <clears throat> excuse me. And, uh, uh, then I went out and sold had a, had a client list and was doing pretty good. I was making more money than I was doing the end of my store. Uh, but and then I started, that's when I really started doing more for cowboy. And then the more I did, the more time it started to take, I was placing ad buys in other markets. I was writing radio copy. I was recording spots, uh, things like that, uh, working on promotions. You know, I had a, a beer night. Don't ever have a beer night at a pro wrestling event. I learned that in one night, it was hard to, uh, maintain. I mean, when, when you got free beer or nickel beer, or whatever it was, God almighty, you're just feeding the, the savages more fuel. So we only had one beer night and, uh, but I use radio a lot. It was, I always found it amazing that so many of Bill's peers in the wrestling business 
did not believe in radio. What they didn't believe in Connie was spending more money right, and justifying it. So, uh, we did that and, uh, made relationships in all these markets. So it worked out real well in that respect. But, uh, I finally, it was a kind of a long route to get back. And a lot of things just worked out in my favor. And, and I, I, Bill just made me an offer that was really good. And then I, again, when I got working with him for a while, he, he paid me, you know, I was making six figures back in those days. And, uh, I thought I was doing pretty good. You are doing pretty good and you can be doing a little better. Thanks to our friends at blue chew boys and girls. We are day one supporters of blue chew and you will be too. Once you try it, if you haven't tried it already, what are you waiting for? You see, Blue Chew is a unique online service that delivers you the same active ingredients as Viagra, Cialis, and Levitra, but in chewable form and at a fraction of the cost. You can take them anytime, day or night, so you can plan ahead or be ready whenever an opportunity arises. And the process is simple. You'll sign up at BlueChew.com, consult with one of their licensed medical providers, and once you're approved, you'll receive your prescription within days. So the best part, man, it's all done online. That means no visits to the doctor's office, no awkward conversation, and no waiting in line at the pharmacy. Blue Chew's tablets are made in the USA, prepared and shipped directly to your door, all in a discreet package. But there won't be anything discreet about your package. Blue Chew wants to help you have better sex. Discover your options at bluechew.com. Chew it and do it. And we've got a special deal for our listeners. Try Blue Chew free when you use our promo code JR at checkout. Just pay $5 shipping. That's bluechew.com. The promo code is JR to receive your first month free. Visit bluechew.com for more details and important safety information. And we want to thank Blue Chew for sponsoring the podcast. Sincerely, y'all. They've been day one sponsors here on the program. If you enjoy what Jim and I are doing every week, we would appreciate if you would at least try Blue Chew. It's absolutely free. All you got to do is pay the shipping. It's five bucks. And boom, you're going to get to experience it. And I'm telling you, you're going to be, as JR says, in a reorder situation. You're also going to be in a reorder situation. If you check out some of our brand new swag and merch that we've got, we've got brand new t-shirts and koozies and hats and tumblers and something for everybody that you can support here for grilling JR. Uh, and it's easy to do that, by the way, if you're interested, please, it costs nothing to look. That's what our pal JR says all the time. You can find it right now at grillingjrts.com, including the famous where's my push damn it t-shirt. <laughs> uh, let's jump right back into it here. Uh, we've got, um, to tell the best parts of the story, I suppose, because we know that not only are you coming back, but Paul Bosch is now working with Watts. What can you tell us about how that deal came together? Paul Bosch in Houston, just an iconic legacy promoter for decades. Yeah. And now he's going to be working with the cowboy. Yeah. No, <clears throat> no kidding. I, uh, they were like oil and water sometimes, both really smart guys. Paul Bosch is a great uh, Houstonian. He had, uh, he did so much charity work, uh, in Houston, uh, all good causes, uh, and, uh, was just, uh, an outstanding citizen of Houston, but he had an ego. He had been used to running it, his town, and he may have run Beaumont occasionally or things like that, but. He, he was, uh, he had one way of doing things. And so instead of confronting, Con, uh, Conrad, he, instead of confronting the cowboy, he would, uh, throw a little bit of that my way. Cause I was the kid who's watch wants to use on commentary. And, and the best way I could illustrate that relationship that I had with Mr. Bosch was, uh, you know, he. He, we had a stick mic. We didn't have a headset. We didn't have two headsets. We didn't have one headset. We had a stick mic. So he would hold when he wanted me to say something or, or, or was nice enough to let me say something, he would, uh, put the mic in front of me and I would start my spiel. But when he was through, when he had heard enough in his mind, no matter if I was in the middle of a sentence or not, he would take the mic back and finish his business wasn't fun 
And then I got in the back and Cowboy would say, I told you to say during dog's match to talk about blank and blank. You didn't talk about either one of them. What the hell's wrong with you? I said, your partner, I said, you didn't look back at the tape. He, he, uh, he didn't want me to talk. That's something you got to settle with him. I can't, I can't, I can't give you what you want if I don't have a microphone. So, uh, I res as much as I respected Paul for all of his civic, uh, uh, work, uh, he was quite the character bigger than life. I know Bruce is a big mark for Paul Bosch cause he was, oh, yeah. you know, so Bruce might not agree with my assessment of him, but <clears throat> Mr. Bosch had a huge ego and he didn't want to change anything, but he, his business was down and the reason it was down because of talent. Cowboy had the talent and, and Houston was not out of the way to route, you know, as far as Southern Louisiana coming over to Houston, easy or somewhat easy. So, uh, but Paul didn't have any significant talents. I mean, we had rock and roll express. We had junkyard dog, hacksaw, Jim Duggan. We had some hot guys and they popped Houston. Uh, I think Houston made as much money as during that time as it ever had is my understanding. I might be wrong. Uh, you should ask Bruce sometimes. He'll tell you, but Bruce was, uh, Bruce loved Mr. Bosch and he should it's like, I love the cowboy. Nothing, not much different. Eventually you get the call. You still interested in broadcasting, Jim? You bet your ass. I'm still interested. I reply. <laughs> we'll start you back as a ring announcer. You have experience there. Then we'll see how you go. And later, I want to try something new on the promos. Jimmy Watt said, I want you to be the interviewer. You're already doing all the publicity. So you know what we need to put out there. I was thrilled, but a bit shocked. These local promos are the lifeblood of the company. Whatever you need me to do. I replied, show me what you want. And he cuts you off. I'm not going to be involved. You're in charge. Man, you want to talk about a vote of confidence? Yeah. I mean, just to add context to this, these localized promos, I mean, let's just call it what it is. Wrestling television back then was an infomercial to get you to come out to the shows and buy tickets. Yep. And we're constantly showing you the start of angles and the start of feuds and, 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 and big money moments. But in order to see the conclusion, well, you need to come on down to the arena and bring $10 and pay for parking. And well, the kids need a ticket and. We got a special offer for you this weekend down at the blah, blah, blah. So you're doing all of that and becoming sort of the stick man for these money promos. These guys are cutting and a money promo, meaning they're trying to sell tickets and you're now an integral part of that, not just marketing it to sponsors and television stations, but the actual not B to B, but now B to C. I mean, you're selling tickets directly to the consumer with these promos and without those ticket sales. Well, there's no revenue. This is before licensing is crazy and television rights, and there's no pay-per-view. If there's no ticket sales, man, your ass is out of business. So this is quite the opportunity for you and a hell of a vote of confidence from the cowboy. Fair to say. Yeah, yeah it was, I was, it was a big deal for me. Hey, uh, uh, Dave, put that picture back up with cowboy and I sitting at the desk on oh, There you go. Look at the circles under my eyes. You're a tired boy. It looks like I hadn't slept in a week and it may be yeah. close to true. Yeah. Uh, I didn't, uh, I wasn't lazy, but man, the hours are, uh, was, it was immense. And Bill was reluctant to remove, uh, uh, Boyd Pierce from the host. Uh, cause it was always about, you know, welcome to mid South wrestling. I'm your host Boyd Pierce. And this, and here's cowboy Bill Watts. Then the next thing he would do is. Hope you enjoyed Mid South Wrestling. I'm Boyd Pierce for Cowboy Bill Watts. So long, everybody. There's old Boyd. I kind of look like a pair of brown shoes at a former wedding of that picture. Again, the circles. Bad haircut. I need a makeover, Connie. I needed some sun and I needed a haircut. But Boyd was a classic guy. What a fun guy he was to be around. So uh things just kept evolving. And the only thing I could do is to do whatever those new jobs were really, really well. I was actually getting as much TV time as Boyd, for example. 
uh, because three times during an hour's wrestling show, I would be on the, in those breaks talking to a talent or two talents about, uh, you know, what's going to happen in Baton Rouge, what's going to happen here in Lafayette or what's going to happen in Jackson, Mississippi or wherever it may be. So it was a huge responsibility, but it kept getting me more exposure which finally then evolved into, uh, my, uh, moving to the desk, sitting next to cowboy, which is kind of what I always wanted to do. Well, you get your way, man. And, uh, boy, wrestling is, uh, never the same for you. You're going to be off to the races and there's so many things that happen behind the scenes. We could talk about mid South forever. I I'm sure this is part two of many, many, but I do briefly want to ask you about some of the talent trades that bill would do with Jerry Jarrett. It felt like he was always trying to keep things new and fresh. And I know you've said here on the program before that what wrestling fans want is new. Yep. Um, eventually you get to meet Jerry Lawler through this process. Yeah. And it's funny now with the benefit of hindsight, what we know now, we didn't know back then how this would wind up, but what was your first impression of Jerry Jarrett? And more importantly, Jerry Lawler. Well, Jarrett was very smart. You could tell, uh, he had his act together. He was smart, sharp guy, been booking that territory, running that territory in Memphis forever. And he was good at his job. Very good. Uh, so, uh, and Lawler was, I couldn't believe when he and I, we, he and I did a match together on mid South, Jerry and I, Jerry Lawler and I came out there and, and, uh, Jarrett's suggestion, cowboy want to appease Jarrett in all ways, uh, uh, acquiesced. And so, uh, one for one match on mid South, here comes, uh, Jerry Lawler for his first announcing experience with Jr. Of course, we, we had no idea where that was going to go. We're certainly not where it went. Uh, but I knew I was shocked pleasantly. So of how good. Lawler and I fit first time out. It's just, we had a lot of the same mindset. We had the same timing, you know, uh, situations. We just, we worked, it worked fine. It was scary how good it was, but, uh, he, he and I had a great chemistry from the day one. I don't know how to explain it. It was just, it just happened. And God, it made, it made life so much better. It made WWE that much better over, over the years when we became broadcast partners. So, uh, it was an, another day learning and I had so many of those and I, I'm blessed to have them. You'd obviously be spending a lot of time with the big cat, Ernie lad. What can you tell us some of your favorite stories about working with Ernie and, and what you learned from him really? Oh, well, I learned. Uh, a lot about interacting with African-American athletes and I hadn't been around them that much. And, uh, Ernie liked me, uh, and I liked Ernie a lot. He was, he was a very strong influence in my career. We would, uh, meet in Shreveport on Tuesdays, every other Tuesday. And then on Wednesday night, we would produce two one hour mid South TV shows. Uh, earlier on uh, Wednesday, we would do the promos. So, uh, and all the talent would come to the TV station, KTBS channel three in Shreveport. And we would go in their studio and do our interviews for the towns to sell tickets like you're talking about. And, uh, then on Tuesday night, after we go over the TV and Ernie would, would, uh, escape his browbeating from cowboy who never liked the first pass at anything. Uh, he wanted to explain this, explain this. And so I listened to Ernie explain to bill what we're doing on TV. God is great. So, uh, uh, then after the, after the meeting cowboy would re let us leave and we would go down the hall. I remember the last times we stayed at the, uh, holiday and holodome largely because it had remote control television, crazy as it sounds. And, uh, we'd go to my room, smoke 
and play dominoes till half the night. It all depended on if Ernie was up or if he was down. If he was down <clears throat> and I was beating him, uh, we, we'd play till he got closer. We were very competitive in our domino games, and I still love to play dominoes. Just don't have very many people to play with anymore, but uh, I learned a lot through those domino games, Conrad. I heard about the Bible. I heard about Bible verses. I heard the stories of the AFL, the American Football League. You know, Ernie was a powerful influence of that league. He got the All-Star game moved one year from, uh, I think, I can't remember what town, out of, out of New Orleans, ironically. Ernie was a good man, a real good man. He was like a brother to Cowboy. And sometimes when they talked, you know, I remember Cowboy said to him one time, God almighty, Ernie, if you were so smart, you wouldn't be an in. I'm thinking, okay, I'm dying right here. You just called a 6'9", 300-pound, great athlete, big, strong, fearless athlete, the N-word. And uh, I was in shock. I asked Ernie about that. I said, that, he said, well, he has a way I hurt my feelings from time to time. I said, he said, I know he doesn't mean it. I said, well, I'm sure glad you know that because I was figured you were going to kill us. And uh, he started laughing. But I loved Ernie. Learned so much about life, dealing with people, things like that. You know, Ernie was the backbone of the junkyard dog. Ernie was the guy that kept created it with Cowboy. But he Ernie got to book it the way he wanted and uh, made, made JYD one of the biggest stars in the world. Let's talk a little bit about um, the change in the product. For mid south i mean it's different from the cartoon characters that we would maybe see in the wwf is it that nitty gritty down and dirty brawling blood i mean is that sort of what made mid south different from say jim crockett promotions and and the wwf <laughs> well maybe maybe uh could be the uh we had a style and it was based on physicality and logic booking that made sense and giving the fans a conclusion, uh, and not open-ended finishes. There was conclusion in, in most of the things that we did that would lead to next week. Uh, it was, it was probably the greatest example of episodic television that I have of any company that I ever worked for. Because we had a roster of 14, 16 guys, not many. And so some of them had to lose. So they all learned to, to, to improve their skill sets so that they could, they could, they could have a loss. But you know, if the announcers are doing their job, the talents are doing their job. You hope that you in the, even in the course of losing, you come out on positive on the, on the other side. And there's a way to do that. There's a way to, do, I think, uh, last week when we had, uh, on collision, Connie, I think Ricky Starks left the ring after losing to CM Punk in better shape than he was before the match started. I agree. So it's like the old saying, you know, you can go over or you can get over. You sure as hell want to get over to go over in a meaningless match that, uh, you know, it's, it loses some luster, uh, but you can, you can, you can lose and get over if everybody's doing their job. That's how the business was, was designed because you know, they didn't, they didn't have dusty finishes in the Thez era, right? You know, that was the promoters and the audience demanded a conclusion. It might make you happy. It might make you sad. If it made you sad, maybe you could hold your out hopes for a, uh, uh, a rematch and a return. So now you get guys, well, I, or he, I beat him once. I don't, they have excuses yeah. they're, and they're rethinking the business. And that's embarrassing. Sometimes to think that you look at the logic that some of these dudes utilize. Uh, it's just hard to, it's the old head scratcher. What are we doing? 
So you, you, you got to learn to work. And if you learn to work well enough, then you will learn how to lose and forward yourself. And that's a, a good example of that, as I just mentioned, is Ricky Starks and CM Punk last week on Collision. Let's talk about Jim Cornette. I know we're winding things down here, but boy, he was a big part of a big, uh, big part. T- talk to me about his contributions to, uh, to mid South. Well, Corny brought a great mind. He was an amazing talent. I've always said that, uh, I think that Bobby Heenan was the best manager that I ever saw all around, all around, but right there on his heels was, uh, Jim Cornette. Heenan could take great bumps because he was a former worker. Uh, and he knew how to take bumps. Uh, he was great. Took a great ass weapon as the cowboy would say. Corny was right there. Uh, he was, uh, I don't know. He was a huge get for us, a difference maker. And I, I know that he would all those years, him watching tons of hours of pro wrestling television and, and having worked in that Memphis territory, that cowboy, uh, drained corny for ideas. And, uh, and Corny showing his future booking chops was able to communicate with cowboy in a good way. So that was great because it was fresh ideas. Uh, it was the, the midnight express or heat was a big thing in our territory period. If you had the balls to be a heel in mid South, uh, and you got over, you're going to draw a lot of money because people are going to leave their homes venture to the venue to see you get your ass whipped. That's the bottom line. Corny was a great addition. And, uh, he went there. There's Ray Fernandez, Hercules Hernandez right there. Another nice guy left us way too soon. And, uh, but Corny made, he, he made everybody he managed better. Yeah. Without, without exception. And like you mentioned earlier, to top of the show today, uh, FTR and punk, uh, uh, acknowledging Dennis Condry, you know, yes. I didn't know Dennis had that, that, uh, voice health, health, health thing, you know, or he, he had his hard time talking. Mm-hmm. I didn't know that I hadn't seen him in years, but he was a hell of a hand. And then he put him with Bobby Eaton. You got magic. Then he put him with Jim Cornette and you got a team of average sized guys that set it on fire and, uh, we're blessed to have had Jim Cornette on our, our team back then. He was special. And, uh, to me, he'll always, he he said, Hey, look, I Conrad, you and I are a little eccentric. Corny's an outspoken guy. His podcast world is good. I'm happy for him, uh, and all that. But, uh, he's he was a, he was a keeper. And a, and a great talent. And he had a lot of heat boy. And to his credit, he wasn't afraid. If he was, he didn't show it out of character. So, uh, Jim Cornette was, a he was special and he still is. Well said, let's do some questions. We've got a live studio audience today. Of course, when you sign up for ad free shows, not only get these shows early and ad free and a ton of bonus content. You get to be a part of our live studio audience. I want to thank everybody for showing up and showing out this morning. Uh, let's do a question here from coach Keith Morrison. He wants to know, Jr. what's your fondest memories of Irish McNeil's boys club? And what do you rank it as far as places to do television? Taping? <laughs> well, it was a little dump, to be honest with you. And we had one bathroom, you know, it had two entrances into the locker room, which is the same, same room. Uh, it just looked like we had two locker rooms, one for the baby faces and one for the heels. Uh, but it had character and, uh, you know, we had that same little crowd on pretty much every week, a lot of the same faces. It was a typical territory, uh, uh, scenario. It's like studio wrestling, except it was at a, a little venue, uh, out there on the fairgrounds there in Shreveport. So a lot of great memories. Uh, it was just, it was just, a a special place in time where all these things came together. 
and uh but it didn't the facilities weren't great you know we i remember talking to boyd boyd pierce and we'd do a show and then we you'd leave your table and walk to the back and up the stairs to the quote unquote dressing room or dressing rooms and boyd would say man this is the longest walk you'll ever take because as soon as we open the door, we're going to know if he liked it or he didn't like it because cowboy was not on the headset. We didn't have anybody on the headset. They, he went over the show. He gave us our bullet points and expected us to get them in. So, uh, boy, or excuse me. Uh, yeah, boy, had a good point there and you never knew. You never knew how, how it was going to be received. But it was it was a campy little place, very very tight, but uh, great memories. Aaron Sheen wants to know favorite moment from your time in Mid South, and is there anything you would change? Oh, I'm not a big changer. It happened for a reason. Yeah. Uh, no, I mean I, I I I had a great time uh, working for Cowboy. Uh, it was an adventure every week. You know, he was smart enough to change bookers while I was there. We had Ernie Ladd, we had Buck Robley, we had Bill Dundee, we had Ken Mantell among those I can think of off the top of my head. So cowboy was smart to always try to infiltrate, uh, uh, you know, his, his company with fresh ideas. Dick Slater was a booker. Not a great booker, but a booker. And uh, Dickie didn't make it because Cowboy demanded everybody to be on time. If he, if you want to, if you're going to have a meeting at 10 a.m. to go over TV, he expects the TV to be written. Uh, and sometimes Dickie was late. Sometimes he didn't. He had the first hour done, but not the second hour. That didn't go well with the big man. So, uh, but Cowboy was smart, and and that which gave me, you know. I've always said, you know, you've got to change creative influences as long as one person is in charge to make the final, final decision. And that was bill. So, uh, it was, it was always, it was always fun in that regard and kept different and kept it fresh. And I learned a lot from all those bookers. Matthew podcast network wants to know two questions. I guess we'll just do the one here. Can you share a memorable moment or match that stands out in your time in mid South wrestling? Well, there are a lot of them, but I think some of those matches between Buzz Sawyer and Jim Duggan are unforgettable. They beat the shit out of each other. I don't think they liked each other. It certainly didn't appear that they liked each other the way they were working, but Duggan and, uh, Buzz Sawyer had some displays of violence that were still etched in my mind, but there are a lot of others <laughs> midnight express. Think about this coming red. Think about a fresh young midnight express versus a rock and roll express in matches that you had never seen before. They had worked together some, uh, but remember the midnight express were created in mid South. That's right. Uh, and, and of course they grew up with Ricky and Robert, the rock and roll express in that Memphis territory. So they had a familiarity with each other. So I really, uh, I'd say some of those midnight, early midnight rock and roll matches are really, really good. Uh, and, uh, but the Duggan bus Sawyer feud was uh, legendary in that part of the world. Let's do, uh, one here from the roach, he wants to know what outlaw promotions ran the mid South territory and how did Watts respond to them? Well, they weren't many of them. Yeah. They didn't make any money. <laughs> I don't, you know, I don't think he responded whatsoever. What did you expect him to do? Bust in during the show and beat everybody up. <clears throat> I, I no, I don't, I'm sure there were some outlaw groups running. Why not free right. country? It was not a, it was not an issue. Wasn't on Cowboys radar. Watts has been a, a polarizing figure in wrestling for better or worse. And Peter D has a question about maybe one of the darker sides of his personality. Hi, JR. Bill Watts is regarded as a bully with talent. 
that he pick and choose who he would target. I assume no one pushed Dr. Death around. I wasn't there. Peter D wasn't there. You were there. What about this narrative that Watts was a bully? Did you see it? And, and, and how did he go about picking targets? What would set him off? If you will. Well, uh, he had two or three rules. As long as you adhere to those two or three rules, you didn't hear shit from him. I got you. So can you come to work on time, Conrad? Right. Can you be straight when you get here? And can you give me maximum effort? If uh, yes, yes, yes. Then you're, you're way down the road of, on being on the Cowboys good side. He had no, uh, he did not, uh, I'm trying to figure out how to say this. He was an equal opportunity offender. What nobody says. He didn't. I've, I've seen him shoot junkyard dog's ass out unmercifully cause dog was late or lazy or whatever. And, uh, but yeah, he was, he, he didn't, he didn't pick favorites. If you screwed up and you got on the shit list, you had to wipe and he was wiped really hard. <laughs> Ari Rosenbaum wants to know after Watts bought the territory from Leroy, why was mid South, not a member of the NWA, but was still loosely affiliated with the NWA. Bill didn't want to give the NWA any his money. There you go. He thought it was a, a joke. Good old boy deal. And, uh, he also had a thought his logic was I'm not going to join the NWA, but I am going to use the NWA champion. I eat the Nate. <laughs> I use flair a lot. And the way that worked was Cowboys justification for getting dates on the champion was if you ever get sued, uh, for antitrust situations, you can say that you don't, that some of your people that use the champion or talents are, uh, uh, you know, they're, they're independent. You can't sue me for, I'm trying to think how to put this Conrad. You, I, it's not like you can say, you know, uh, we're, we're going to, we're going to have the, uh, you can't have a, a, a lawsuit over this, but I'm missing a word here and I can't think of what the hell it is. <laughs> so, uh, so his deal was, I give you guys an out. I'll bring the champion in. I'll make the champion a lot of money. At least that's the plan. And then we'll, we'll move on. You'll get your little piece champion will make some extra cash but I'm not going to be a member because I'm helping you guys quite frankly. So that way somebody sues you, uh, you can't say it's a, you know, a closed circuit type, the closed business. In other words, you're going to be a member. So therefore some of those lawsuits would never have been, would never have stuck. So that was his reasoning. He's never a member. was never going to be a member of the money that he made. He wanted to keep. Jay Sharplin has a great question. And I didn't know this being that you're the celebrity face of OU football. I've always wanted to know when you were first introduced to mid South Boyd Pierce said you went to Oklahoma state. What's the story? If any, thanks. I, I did. <clears throat> I went to Oklahoma state for on a scholarship, academic scholarship for, uh, a year. I think it was, uh, and, I. uh, but OU is always, it's like they, they won. Yeah. They're winning. Yeah. How do you not pull for that? Yeah. Uh, how do you not? You're right. So, uh, but I went to Oklahoma state because I had, I had, uh, had help, uh, scholarship wise. So, uh, and my mom and dad kind of wanted me to go there. It was an agricultural type thing. And they were still holding out hope that I was going to do something along those lines. I think I was there. I think I was there a year. Then I transferred to Northeastern state and Tahlequah. Love that. Love that small school atmosphere. And, uh, so I don't dislike o Oklahoma state <laughs> out of respect for my, my native American brother, Jerry Briscoe. I support him every game, but one, and I guess this is to be the last year that Oklahoma state. No, you are going to play for the foreseeable future, which I hate. It's disgusting. 
they should always they should have kept that game somehow, some way, non league or whatever. But yeah, I I I like OSU, but the Sooners are my team. Uh, Lori E has a great question here. Hello, Mr. Ross. I loved Mid South Wrestling, but was Riser Bowden as cool as he seemed? What was the atmosphere when Cowboys smacked Jim Cornette in that angle? Oh, Reeser Bowden. Re- Reeser. Reeser was the booth announcer uh, at KTVS. Cowboy got him on the payroll, good PR. Uh, he was very laid back. I remember him doing an interview, I think with super destroyer in the studio, he's sitting in his little high top chair and somehow the guys got rambunctious and inadvertently knocked Reeser out of his chair. And then we went to break and made sure he was okay. And I remember him saying this, he said, I don't like being treated like a plate full of piss, a plate full of piss. So, uh. But he was pretty cool. He's laid back, pretty cool guy, calm, cool, collected. Didn't get too excited. Had a nice, smooth voice. But he was a he was a good dude. He was there for a long time. A lifer at that station. Uh, US expat fan says, "Hi Jim, if you could take a couple of wrestlers who are currently active back in time and drop them in Mid South, who would you take and why?" Is there a wrestler today or a few maybe that you can think of who would have been a good fit for Mid South? Samoa Joe would have, Conrad. Samoa Joe for one. CM Punk for one. Uh, uh, I'll just, it's slipping my mind. I embarrass myself sometimes. Lance Hoyt. Yeah, the, the, the big guy in the House of Black. Oh, yeah. Brody King. Brody King. I love him. Yeah. I love the House of Black in general, but Brody King's a man's man. So I, I would, he would be one. I, I said this before cowboy would have loved him, you know, athletic, big men draw money still works today. He's 300 pounds right at it. I'm guessing and athletic move his feet, moves around well. So, uh, uh, as a matter of fact, I think they're in that main event Saturday night. So with, uh, with, uh, FTR and, and, and punk. So if I'm not mistaken. Uh, but they're good. They're really good. And he is a keeper. He's a guy that cowboy would, would embrace as best. I think cowboy could. would have liked Keith Lee too. Big no dude, doubt. athlete, athletic, yep. amazing. I agree. Good, good call. Uh, let's do uh, a few more and then we'll put a bow on this one. Don Wayne wants to know when JYD left, did JR know he needed to move on as well? No, hell no. I wasn't going anywhere. I was loyal to cowboy. Right. He's paying me good money. Uh, and, and I was going to show my loyalty by sticking, sticking with him. You know, that didn't work out well for JYD. He had a couple of real good years. Thanks to his merch and so forth. And, uh, in WWF at that time, but no, hell no. I didn't have any, now would I like to have gone to WWF at that time or at some time of course. Cause they were considered the major league. They're the big time, they were big stuff, but I wasn't going to do it at the sake of my relationship or my loyalty to cowboy. Uh, I know I'm doubling back, but you know, I just thought of another name, a big athletic dude that cowboy would have liked and powerhouse Hobbs. That's got mid South all over him. Doesn't yeah, it? Yeah. Yeah. Ernie would have molded powerhouse Hobbs into another dog. Yeah. <laughs> and, uh, it would have worked. Willie Hobbs is a stud and, uh, he's going to be a big deal in wrestling for a long time. I think he will. I really do. I think he's got a great upside and a great future. Uh, two more Peter D wants to know, hi, Jr. The crowds at mid South appear older than crowds today. What were the differences that you've seen between audiences then and now? Well, the demographic changes a little bit. Uh, the arena shows, uh, seem to draw more of the younger guys, younger fans, rowdy fans, 18 to 34s, uh, in the, in age group. Um, but the, those, those ones that were coming to the TV, they were all regulars. Hell, it's almost like some of them sit in the same seats. So it was pretty cool. Let's, uh, 
let's do this as a big finish Instagram or wrestling historian wants to know what's the most important thing you learned from Bill Watts. Listen to your audience, listen to your audience. They'll tell you what they like. They'll tell you how much they like it. And it's up to you to recognize it and embellish it. So understanding your audience and what they like and what they want and what they need to see, give them a surprise every now and then, uh, and make it as good as you can, but understanding your audience, it's like doing market research. You can't be successful selling anything unless you understand where your audience is, where your customer base is located and how to reach them with your sales message. Cowboy was a master at that. Next week, we're going to be talking about SummerSlam 1998. It was the highway to hell, two baby faces on top, good guy, stone cold against good guy, undertaker, the company's never been hotter. We're going to talk about that title match. We'll also talk about Hunter and rock and another epic ladder match from MSG, but a little different from the one we saw at WrestleMania 10. Of course, you get all these shows early and ad free over at adfreeshows.com. And man, we are loaded down with bonus content. We just rolled out a brand new program called Tuesdays with the Taskmaster. We've got Monday mailbags with Mike Kyoto and Nick Patrick. We've got the insiders where I talk to people. Maybe you don't often hear from like Dan Bynum is my most recent one. We've got ask Conrad as a bonus feature there. We're also doing something called the false finish. And as soon as we finish recording here today, I'm going to be catching up with yet another talent. That was an accidental series for us. Chris Harris was so phenomenal. I said, man, we need more of this. Glacier was guest two. You're going to love guest three. And maybe my favorite piece of bonus content I create every month over at ad free shows is the book. We have Jim Crockett juniors, red books from the excellent penmanship of JJ Dillon and the genius booking mind of dusty Rhodes. We're taking you episodically day by day, week by week, month by month. You'll see the actual handwritten notes and we'll get the backstory behind the story from a member of a wrestling royalty. If you will, Mr. David Crockett. It's all happening over at adfreeshows.com. You can even be a part of our live studio audience. And we've got a bonus piece of content from every single show on the network. So you'll get a little bonus Q and a where you're live on video, asking Jr and other hosts, all your questions that happens at adfreeshows.com. By the way, if your business targets men that are 25 to 54 years old, no better place to advertise than right here on grilling Jr. advertise with Jr.com has all the details. And I also want to mention, if you're looking forward to seeing Jim, well, man, pick up tickets, AEWTIX.com. He is back on the road for collision. And on August 20th, he's going to be at wrestle bash in Fairfield, New Jersey. The asylum wrestling store.com is where you can find all the info, the asylum wrestling store.com. And of course, a week later, man, he's in Wembley and a week after that, we're all going to be together in Chicago for Starcast. Come see Jr. on the road. And if you can't see Jr. in person, the next best thing is to get a little Jr. delivered to your house. And the way yeah. to do that is <laughs> Jr's BBQ.com. Yes. He's got action figures. Yes. He's got trading cards, but he's also got two types of barbecue sauce, your Chipotle ketchup, your main event mustard, the jerky, the hot sauce, and my favorite, the all purpose seasoning, something for everybody right here. Smack dab in the middle of grill, grilling season. It doesn't get any better than Jr's BBQ.com. Yeah, they make great gifts too, uh, for the wrestling fan in your family. So, uh, check it out. We, it's, it's worth a shot at giving it, you know, it's all family recipes and, uh, it's growing well exponentially, uh, always do more business, always appreciate the business, but, uh, look at it as a, something new to try tastes good, affordable. We'll ship it to you. And if you have any issues as some have done, uh, they've messaged me if their shipment was coming late or whatever, uh, you know, we can't control the shipping, but we can follow up on it and make sure you get what you bought, what you paid for. So JR's BBQ.com, our online site never closes. Give us a shot. We appreciate your consideration and your business. Uh, every single order is appreciated very much. So thanks everybody. Hey, I want to thank all the folks too. in Charlotte last week, I had a huge line. I don't saying that as, as an egomaniac, but golly, the fans are just wonderful. And we had a, we had a great turnout 
I'll be making more appearances here, there, and yon. Uh, moderation, my boy, as my dad would say. So we're going to be doing some of those. Everything is good, man. Life is good. I just got to get, just keep working, just getting healthier. And I'm doing that, I'm doing all I can do. Well, we're pulling for you, Jim. Can't wait to talk to you again next week. Can't wait to see you this Saturday. You're going to be in Greensboro for collision. Tickets are still on sale. Be a part of this show. Uh, anytime you get to see wrestling in Greensboro, it's a good time. It's AEWTIX.com. We also would love to have your support on social media. If you've got a question about SummerSlam 98, you can ask it right now. It's at JR Grilling on Twitter and Instagram. Grilling JR over on Facebook. And the easiest, cheapest way to support the show is check us out on YouTube. Grilling JR on YouTube.com. If you're like me, I mean, I'm 42 years old. Some of these stories and these characters I'm hearing about, I have never heard of these folks before. So to actually have a, a, a photo reference of this and getting to see some of these memories from JR's upbringing in the professional wrestling business, it really adds another dimension to the podcast. So thank you for listening to us on your podcast feed, but be sure to check out the shows every now and again over on YouTube. Uh, just having some visual aids just brings this whole thing to life. It's grilling JR on youtube.com. That's grilling JR on youtube.com. Jim, I appreciate all the time today. I just love talking about Mid-South with you. Can't wait to do it again. Uh, but I'm excited to talk about the business being hotter than ever before when we cover SummerSlam 98 next week. Yeah, it's going to be good. That's a great time, Connie. A lot of good memories, a lot of great backstories. Uh, so we'll, I'm looking forward to that show. And we appreciate everybody's loyalty. Tell a friend about our podcast uh, and watch it grow even more. So uh, we're blessed and we appreciate you guys. And we'll see you next week right here on Grilling JR with the voice of wrestling, Mr. Jim Ross. See you in Greensboro, TNT, 8 o'clock Eastern for a Collision. Should be a hell of a show. I love that show. That Conrad does too. So we're going to, it's, it's going to be more physical, I think, than the other uh, AEW produced shows. And that may get me some heat. Heat, God damn it. Uh, Jim Cornette, but I, 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 I just believe that we got something special we're building there. If you haven't watched it, tune in, check it out. Eight o'clock Eastern time, TNT Saturday night. See you there. So long everybody. Hey guys, Eric Bischoff here. And just want to call a quick timeout. I want to tell your listeners about what I've been telling everybody at over at 83 weeks, quite a while now about all the cool things that are happening over at adfreeshows.com. On the debut episode of Making the Town, Blue Meanie takes us through the memorable matches and moments of the famed ECW arena, including one that was never seen. Something very special happened after the power went off. Uh, Paul Heyman went out into the ring and spoke to the crowd without a microphone, and the crowd just stayed quiet and listened. And he gave the most heartfelt thank you to that crowd that night. And uh, the biggest shame of it is there's no footage of it because the power went out. On an all-new Tuesday with the Taskmaster, Kevin Sullivan talks about what some of the greatest factions of all time have in common. Four horsemen, four guys, mm. when they're the strongest. NWO, four guys when they're the strongest. And then Bloodline, four guys. But they also had a manager, each one of them, J.J., Eric and Paul E. That's just a small taste of what we've got waiting for you with four levels to choose from. See for yourself why Ad Free Shows is the best value in wrestling today. Sign up now at adfreeshows.com.